So our speaker for today um, will be Zara Raman, and she will be talking to us about communities, marginalized communities, and their representation in data. Um, and more specifically, she will be telling us whether it is preferable for marginalized communities and on which cases to be uh, reflected, to be represented in institutional data, and in which cases this could be harmful. So um, privacy and anonymity are preferred. So please let us give Zara a warm round of applause. All right, thank you all for coming on this lovely warm day. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the representation of marginalized communities in data. So this is based on some work that I've been doing with the Engine Room on the theme of responsible data and some work with Tactical Tech on data and discrimination. So to start that work, we, I started thinking, like, what is discrimination? It's when groups of people are treated in an unfair or biased way based on some arbitrary category, like their skin color or their gender or any number of other things. Um, so how can data uh, facilitate or mitigate discrimination in all its different forms? Um, so I started looking at the people who are living on the margins of society. So that's what I mean by marginalized communities, people who don't often get their needs seen to, people who are excluded from what's considered to be regular society. Um, and I started by doing this um, by looking at the anti-discrimination movement um, and what they're pushing for with regards to data and marginalized communities. Um, so one thing that seems to be a theme among many uh, anti-discrimination movements is the right to be counted. Um, so the right for these communities to be reflected in data sets. So why count? Um, so I've got a couple of examples of, um, yeah, marginalized communities or communities that should be or need to be reflected in data for their needs to be met. Um, so this is a, a slide, um, a screenshot from UNICEF's annual report about the state of the world's children. And in it, they really push for better data collection of um, around children with disabilities living in developing countries. Because um, as they say, without this data, it's impossible to know how these children are being treated, whether they get access to the services they need, whether there are any particularly harmful policies or any particularly beneficial policies that really help them get what they need. And they found, for example, that um, children with disabilities are much more likely to drop out of school a lot earlier. Um, and the data can help, uh, yeah, understand why this happens and try and mitigate this in the future. Um, there is a problem with comparability of data in regards to different abilities and disabilities because the environment that people live in has a huge effect on the effect that their disabilities have on their lives. For example, someone with limited sight who has access to a guide dog has much more independence and can lead a much more, um, yeah, much more fulfilling, one might say, life than someone who lives on their own and doesn't have access to a guide dog and doesn't have anything that they need to live their lives. Um, so this means that even if you do collect data across different countries, it's very difficult to compare what happens in one country, like the quality of life from different countries, um, yeah, without lots of different caveats. But it still might be interesting to see, yeah, different patterns. Um, this is an example from, uh, that you might have come across. Uh, there was an article about it on the front page of Hacker News a couple of weeks ago. Um, until just over two weeks ago, this messy thing was the border between India and Bangladesh. So 51,000 people live in these um, bits marked in red, known as enclaves, which are basically portions of a state that are entirely surrounded by the territory of another state. Um, and this also was the home to the world's only third order enclave. So this was a piece of Bangladesh, no, a piece of India within Bangladesh, within India, within Bangladesh, which is ridiculous. Um, uh, so, but for the 51,000 people living within all of those, I think 162 different enclaves, um, they didn't have access to any basic human rights. They weren't represented in any administrative data sets. They didn't have citizenship. It meant that things like if they wanted to go to a market that was outside of their enclave, they could have lots of problems. They had no 
access to water, no electricity, they couldn't travel, all sorts of things. And reportedly, more than 75% of the people living in Bangladeshi enclaves had spent time in prison for invalid travel. Um, because in theory, someone who lived in an enclave who wanted to travel outside the enclave <clears throat> would need a visa to enter the foreign country. But to get that visa, they would need to travel to a major city in their country, which was impossible for them to do without first going through the foreign country. Um, so this is an example of, yeah, a, po a population who really, really, really needed to be represented in some kind of data set and have their needs seen to. Um, and actually, just on the, on the 31st of July, uh, India and Bangladesh exchanged various parcels of land um, and hopefully cleaned up the border a little bit, which was very momentous for these people. Um, and in preparation for that, one of the first things that was done was um, Indian and Bangladeshi officials, so a team of like uh, 75 different teams, of, we each of one Indian official and one Bangladeshi official, conducted a, a field survey. They went around and collected data on the enclave residents um, to, in the first two weeks of July. Um, and each of the enclave residents was allowed to choose citizenship of either nation. So by the time the official swap took place, they'd all decided upon what citizenship they could claim. And this went into effect on the 1st of August. Um, so it's not, I mean, the problem isn't quite solved as simply as that, because obviously if, for example, families had chosen different citizenships, then now they'll get split up. Um, but it is a first step towards getting these people the... Yeah, the, the access to basic rights that they need, like schools, hospitals, electricity, water, that kind of thing. Um, this is another example of really missing data that was very, very crucial. Um, this is a campaign or a, a project from The Guardian called The Counted. So in the US, um, there's no comprehensive record of people killed by law enforcement. It's up to the states whether they collect this or not. Um, and this lack of really basic data has been very glaring among the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. Um, so at the moment, the FBI run a voluntary program um, so where law enforcement agencies have the choice whether or not to submit um, their annual count of what they call justifiable homicides um, to this centralized database. So to, to counter this, The Guardian, together with its readers, are basically collecting the, the most comprehensive data set of people killed by law enforcement agencies in the US. So they're asking people to submit um, yeah, reports when someone is killed or if they know of someone who's killed in the past, and then they verify it, and together they're, yeah, they're, they're getting this data set. So this is a really, really crucial piece of data that's been missing until now of people who've been being killed and there's been no way to put all this data together and thus no, no way of knowing if there's any patterns, like if, it's, if they happen to be of a certain demographic, for example. Um, this is another nice one that is also quite new called gender balance. Um, so another missing data set is that there's no data set on um, the gender balance of different par parliaments across the world. So you can't answer, for example, what country has the highest proportion of women in parliament, or do women vote differently on different issues? Um, and when did, different, when did women come into power in different countries? As, and you know, did this make a difference in the way that the country is run? Um, so this is a tool called Gender Balance, um, created by developers at My Society. Um, and it's aiming to collect da a database of the gender balance of every parliament in the entire world. And it's doing this by a kind of Tinder-like game. So you can sign up, say what language and what, what kind of country you're most familiar with, and then you swipe right and left if it's a man or a woman. And then they're crowdsourcing this data, verifying it, and then they'll build up this data set and release it as open data. Um, so basically, the reasons for counting, um, for making sure that communities are represented, is so that you can notice different patterns. You can see if there's needs or gaps in the services that are being offered, um, so that there's more accurate dissemination of public funds. Like in lots of countries, it depends very much on population as to where money gets given. Um, and of course, like in our field a lot, and the stuff I've been working on, it strengthens advocacy hugely to be able to point to kind of concrete numbers and say, this many people can't get access to a certain basic human right. But then the other side of it, why not count? Um, 
This is an example from World War II. Um, it was quite recently revealed, after decades of denial, that during World War II, the US Census Bureau provided the Secret Service with data from the 1940 census so that they could identify people of Japanese ancestry, and in their words, to, <laughs> to assist in the roundup of Japanese Amer Americans for imprisonment in internment camps in California and six other states during the Second World War. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this enabled them to collect and to round up and to imprison these people very, very quickly and efficiently, so to speak. Um, and researchers who studied the, the way that this happened, the relationship between this, the Census Bureau and the Secret Service, say that the speed with which uh, the data was released, so it was released just seven days after it was requested, leads them to think that this, that wasn't the first time that that has happened, but it is the first time that it has been um, publicly admitted. Um, another example from Bangladesh. Um, so the Rohingya people are one of the world's most persecuted minorities in Myanmar or Burma. They're stateless. Um, they live in Myanmar where they're regarded as kind of illegal Bengalis, but in Bangladesh they're regarded as, um, yeah, people, they're not regarded as, as Bangladeshi really. So they have, most of the 1.3 million people have no citizenship. And uh, yeah, they also lack very basic human rights. They live in camps, in, yeah, in all sorts of really terrible situations. Um, so recently, a couple of weeks ago, the Bangladeshi government announced that they'd be holding a census of the hundreds of thousands of undocumented Rohingya in Bangladesh who, were, who entered Bangladesh seeking refuge from persecution in Myanmar. Um, but the Rohingya people within Bangladesh are also really, really unpopular. Um, and lots of groups watching over the human rights of the Rohingya are very skeptical as to how this data will be used. Um, so some officials have said that the people are really reluctant to give their data for fear that they'll be deported, so this will be used as a, yeah, by the Bangladeshi government to say, we can't take any more people, we need to send you back. And then they'll go back to Myanmar and they'll face the same thing. Um, another thing that is happening um, among the census, when they're collecting the data, they've often been asking, you have the choice either of identifying yourself as Bengali or not at all. So they're completely trying to erase the Rohingya identity um, in this census data. Um, and yeah, I mean, they say that, that the term implies a lot more than just the ethnicity, that it, that it implies a claim to land, and that's their reasoning for erasing this data, but for the people involved, it's a very important part of their identity, obviously. Um, this actually isn't the first time that the Rohingya have faced discrimination within data sets. So from the other side, in Myanmar, last year, um, they conducted their first census in decades, and they included questions on ethnicity in the census, and some human rights groups said that this was overly sensitive at that time, and they shouldn't be including those questions, but they went ahead anyway. Um, and it turns out that there were a few census workers um, during the census who would go to households, ask them their ethnicity, and if they said Rohingya, they would turn around and go away. So this is completely erasing the, the population of Rohingya from this data set. Um, so clearly the, the issue of race and ethnicity can be very problematic when it comes to marginalized communities, but it's not just ethnicity data that can cause problems. Um, so this is an example from, I think, 2012, where in the Netherlands there, were, um, there was a proposal to make registration of sex workers mandatory, and lots of, um, lots of people within the sex worker community um, yeah, campaigned against registering because uh, they found that would be really stigmatizing for them um, and it would violate their right to privacy. There's also very little evidence that points that... So, yeah, there's very little evidence that shows that uh, registration actually helps fight human trafficking, which is the reason that it was supposedly being done in the first place. Um, yeah, so there's, there's many other examples of why you really shouldn't collect sensitive data. Um, but the kind of middle ground that I seem to have come across between the anti-discrimination movement and the privacy movement, in a way, is a census that's done in a sensitive way. But this also, as we've mentioned, can be a very um, political process. So this is a map I found of um, showing countries where ethnicity or race of people was counted or was included or enumer enumerated in at least one census, in, census since 1991. Um, and it's quite interesting to see the countries that really don't um, collect that data. Um, for example, in France, 
it's forbidden by law to collect any statistics based on ra racial or ethnic origin. Um, but in contrast, there are other things that happen in France that, uh, yeah, kind of go against this. So until recently, it was very usual to put your photos on your CV. Um, so even though you didn't have to state what your race or your, what your ethnicity was, you could see that. And there's lots of research that was done that proved that um, there were many discriminatory hiring practices based on that. Um, and also, I mean, social scientists have devised kind of ways to get around this data. So now, if, for example, they just, they just look at the names of people to, to kind of guess their ethnicity. So it's not like the, the data isn't really being collected, it's more that it's being collected in a kind of ad hoc and, and inaccurate way. Um, obviously, Germany knows the, the horrors that can happen with collecting ethnicity data more than many countries. Um, the Nazis used census data to help track Jews and other minorities. And then, obviously, in East Germany, the Stasi secret police um, maintained really, really comprehensive files on citizens. Um, and interestingly, in the 1980s, attempt at introducing a census in West Germany, I'm sure many of you know this, but for those who don't, um, yeah, sparked massive protests and people refused to actually answer the census and it led to a boycott. It meant the Constitutional Court stopped the census in 1983 and then required a revision of the process, so a more sensitive data collection process. Um, and this is where the term informationelle Selbstbestimmung or um, informational self-determination was first used, which is kind of similar to the right to privacy, but it it gives the individual the right to determine, in principle, the disclosure and use of their own data. Um, and the only limitation to this is when it's in an overriding case of, of public interest. So carrying out a census, as we've, um, as we've established, is hugely, hugely sensitive. But it is kind of crucial when you're trying to give people the things that they need. So who do we trust to carry out the census? In the UK, unfortunately, it's uh, Lockheed Martin, it's America's largest arms manufacturer who carries out the census. Um, and this is the same in the UK, the US, and in Canada. Uh, it's, it's an arms manufacturer who carries out this really, really basic role. So they make Trident nuclear missiles, cluster bombs, fighter jets. Um, they're really into aerospace and defense. They get 80% of their work comes from the US Defense Department. Um, and obviously when this was, so this has been going on for a while, um, and when it happened there was um, kind of an outcry, justifiably, but actually not surprisingly small. Um, in the UK, so this is where I come from, so this is uh, kind of what I've been looking at with my research, um, and the UK government released a privacy impact assessment where they said, you know, it's all the data is owned by the Office of National Statistic, Statistics in the UK, um, but it but Lockheed Martin were the ones who designed the system and who implemented the system. Um, yeah, and the, you know, they said it's a, it's a, a criminal offence to release any of the census data, but then you know, if we look to history, we see some examples of how that hasn't always stood up. Um, so, yeah, Lockheed Martin, they've carried out the census in the UK 2000, and, 2000 2010, in the UK, you know, in the US 2000 and 2010, in the UK, in these, and then in Canada as well. Um, so concerned citizens in the UK, for example, submitted a number of uh, freedom of information requests through the um, freedom of information portal, what do they know? And that's been really interesting to read through, but there's not actually that much more information that's given, um, and it's quite hard to follow. So looking, thinking about choice, like what can people, what can citizens do if they don't want to be giving their data to this company that they, you know, whose morals they might not agree with? I mean, I'm obviously in no... Uh, no position to make any judgment on what's actually done with the data, but just thinking about what role this plays. Um, so there were some really interesting res in responses from anti-war campaigners in the UK, um, because not, carrying, not filling in the census meant that you faced uh, a fine of £1,000. So these campaigners didn't want to give money to the UK government. Um, the Green Party also decided not not to support a boycott of the census because the, f the, the results of the census are used to allocate public funds. So if you don't submit your data, you, don't, you might not get your needs met or get represented in a way that means something to you. Um, so yeah, so they, they didn't recommend boycotting either. So what they planned instead was um, 
making sure that the census process was as expensive as possible for Lockheed Martin. So Lockheed Martin received 150 million pounds for the census, and they estimated, you know, they, and there was a, also an option to um, fill your census data in online. So these anti-war campaigners said, you know, don't fill them on online because that saves Lockheed Martin a lot of money. Uh, make a few mistakes here and there, you know, in your telephone number, in your address, things that don't really matter. Um, yeah, may, maybe like push it right to the deadline, send it by post. Um, and they came up with this list of things that you could do to try and make the census as expensive as possible on an individual level, which I thought was really clever. Um, but, you know, the fact remains that you essentially had no choice of what to do. You had to fill in the census, you had to give your data to this, inst this company. Um, and this is kind of a trend that we're seeing in the UK, at least, of increasing numbers of public-private partnerships. So when the government is partnering with a private co uh, corporation to carry out really core government functions. And this is what I've been looking at with my work at the moment. So um, just another really quick example is G4S. Um, so they're, I think, the world's largest or one of the world's largest security companies, um, making no judgment on what they do with this data. But this is just, just a selection, not even all of the activities that G4S carries out in the UK. And if we look at the people who are affected by most of these things, they're people on the edges of society. They're asylum seekers, they're former offenders, they're people, they're survivors, survivors of domestic violence. They're children. They run eight children's homes um, in the UK, as well as, I mean, G4S also, do, G4S also do a number of other things like run prisons in the West Bank um, and all sorts of horrible, horrible things. So, but the, the, the point here is that they're doing this as subcontractors of the UK government. So if you come into contact with these, in any, with any of these things, it might not, you might not even realize, you likely don't realize that you're not dealing with the government. It looks just like the government, but it's not. Um, and there's no opt-out function. So they're providing really core functions, um, children's homes, CCTV at train stations, for example. So, you know, what does this mean for us? This could have been a really big slide. Um, <clears throat> so, at least in the UK, we seem to be giving up really core functions that should be done by a, a trusted state entity with accountability. And we're giving up that accountability to these companies. Um, so, as a citizen, if one of these companies does something that I don't agree with, it's very kind of murky and difficult to know where the lines of accountability lie. Like, who can I go to to say, hey, they treated me in a bad way, or I don't agree with what they're doing. Um, and there's a complete lack of, well, not a complete lack of transparency, there's a very kind of strategic way that they seem to be doing transparency. For example, if you, if you know where to look with all these, this bureaucracy on the government websites, you can find out that it's companies doing all this, but it takes a long time. And like most people, I mean, I, I don't think many people assume that, you know, when you see someone in a government function to ask, hey, are you from an arms company or a security company? At least I hope not, because that would be terrible. Um, yeah, so some of the work I've been doing with Tactical Tech has been looking at the, the questions we should be asking when we come across relationships like the one we've just described. Like, How can we reclaim that data and those functions? How can we gain more accountability? How do we kind of try and stop this trend or at least try and hold them accountable for their actions? Um, and yeah, there, there aren't any answers yet, I'm sorry. Um, so in conclusion, there, is, there are kind of three basic things that I've, I've realized are kind of emblematic or very important in all of the relationships I just described. Um, transparency, choice, and trust. So transparency about um, who is collecting the data, who actually has access to it, like really. I mean, if you're a company designing a system to collect data, and then the government say, that company actually have no access to it. Do they really, like, who carried out that privacy impact assessment? Do we trust what they're saying or not? Um, is there, you know, is there any, who, who owns that data? Do you have access to be able to say, actually, I don't want that data to be represented here? Um, and then, as I mentioned, the kind of accessible le levels of transparency. So not just saying, oh, you know, it's on a government website somewhere, like making it really, really visible who is doing what so that people can have the choice. Um, is there an option to, be, to not be in the data? So this, you know, speaks to the, the German idea of um, information self-determination. 
Um, you know, is there, is there an actual option to opt out, or do you, are you then facing more exclusion um, or a fine? Um, is there any pressure put on people to opt in, and is it being done by people who hold lots of power? Um, and then the final one, trust. I mean, this depends a lot on where you live, um, whether it's a democracy where you expect, where there's some kind of social contract, where you expect to have that relationship with your, your government. I mean, if it's in, sadly, many of the world's countries, you, you don't have trust, and that's assumed. Um, but, for example, I mean, I'd hope that at least in Germany and the UK, we, we try to establish or kind of try to still claim that level of, of trust to, a, to an extent. Um, do we believe the answers that they're giving? So even if they're, they're being transparent, are they telling the truth? Can we believe them? Um, will this change in the future in any way? Like, if you give your data to one entity and they say, we're going to do this, and you trust them and you believe them, is there any chance that that could change in the future and then that same entity might still have the data? Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's just about it from me. Thank you.